Broadcasting from Millvale Studios, you are listening to Funny Money on the River's Edge Network. I'm your host, Tom Henry, and uh, uh-huh. with us is... Uh, I'm Matt Wolfarth. The other host. Sans glasses. <laughs> I got rid of my glasses. And uh, as always, James, our producer. James uh, was punctual today. He was on time. I was like an little... hour early. I was reading a book. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I always come early. Get everything set up, lights uh, and uh, cameras and all that. James. We appreciate nice. that. We'll we'll note that on your review. <laughs> Do we have reviews here at the River's Edge? Uh, I don't know if we're capable of giving the reviews. I but mean, Brian, make the first. Certainly, Brian yeah. certainly could. <laughs> um, so tonight we're going to be talking about taxes. Oh. And that sounds like boring work and whatnot. But it's actually really interesting. We're talking about two tax preparation companies. Okay. And they, they uh, go I about it in very different ways. Okay. All right. So uh, the first one we're going to be talking about is H&R Block. I heard of them. They've been around forever. They have. Uh, and What does H&R stand for? Uh, it stands for Henry and Richard. Henry and Richard. Okay. So we're, we're going to get into that. This, uh, this information I got uh, is from Wikipedia. And it's from newsroom.hnrblock.com. So uh, that's the H&R Block website, and, and you know it so, explains the history of the company. So they confirmed it. <laughs> so uh, what uh, what we're going to start about uh, talking about is uh, Henry Block. Okay, Henry Block was born in Kansas City in 1922. He's the second son of a prominent Kansas City lawyer. Okay, and this is like almost verbatim from this part, almost verbatim from Wikipedia. I uh, also have to say I did own this stock in the past, but do not currently own it. Um, all right. Uh, he attended Southwest High School uh, and began his college career at the University of Kansas City. Oh, wow. And, and later transferred to University of Michigan, which is a great school, you know, um, from which he graduated in 1944. Wow. And if you know he anything about up. American history, you know, 1944. That was a big one. It was a tumultuous <laughs> year. Yeah. In 45, something <clears throat> happened, right? So, uh, yeah, something was going on in 44, too. So it's called World War II. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Might have heard of it. I'll have to brush up on that. So <laughs> Henry joined uh, the Army Air Corps shortly after uh, the U.S. entered World War II. All right. Uh, Serving in the 8th Air Force as a navigator on B-17 bombers. Oh, my God. That's pretty How awesome cool. is that? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, he's like... Uh, Did they have GPS back then? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, you had to do it like... Redirecting. With a, you know... <laughs> Recalculating. A map, a compass, and yeah. a pencil. That's crazy. Right? That's, uh, yeah, it is pretty wild. It's complex, yeah. Um, so, he, uh, he flew 31 combat missions over Germany. Uh, three of them over Berlin, and uh, afterward he was awarded the Air Medal and three Oak Leaf Clusters. Oh my goodness! I three don't... the the Oak Leaf Clusters are like that's like an for like an additional great thing that you did. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't assume it was bad. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh no, no he's got a, three Oak Leaf Clusters. Get him off our plane. Is yeah. there a poison Ivy Leaf Cluster. <laughs> so. But yeah, the the air uh, the air medal is for outstanding service. Oh man! Uh, yeah, in amazing. an airplane uh, in World War II, um, and uh, during the war, Henry and his brothers Leon and Richard uh, began corresponding with each other about starting a family business, and that's something that the boys' parents had always encouraged. All right, so they were a family of uh, three boys. Okay, the Army Air Corps later sent. Henry to Harvard Business School for graduate training in statistical control. And they do that. They did this. You know, this is like part of the um, uh, what GI you, Bill. GI Bill. Yeah. And uh, that, you know, for someone who exhibited like uh, really intelligent skills during the war, they would get them into really good institutions. So he went to Harvard Business School um, while at Harvard. Uh, he read a transcript of a speech by Professor Sumner Schlichter, Schlichter, a noted authority on economics and labor relations. All right. Big business and labor had many resources, as they do now, uh, Professor Schlichter explained. But small business did not have comparable resources geared to meet its needs. All right. So Henry and his brother saw an entrepreneurial opportunity in providing support and resources to small businesses. So Henry and his older brother, Leon, 
borrowed $5,000 and opened a small bookkeeping business on Main Street in downtown Kansas City. All right. Uh, however, four months later, uh, you know, it was kind of like uh, they, they had few clients. It, it wasn't going gangbusters. Uh, and Leon decided to leave to seek a law degree. Um, so Henry wanted to keep trying. You know, this was kind of his parents' dream that they start a business. Uh, and uh, so he placed a newspaper ad for Help Wanted. And there was only one reply. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like All my right. type of ad. So it's like, you know, uh, do you want to be a bookkeeper? You know, it's, it sure. wasn't that glamorous, you know, right after <laughs> yeah. the war, you know, uh, so, um, but, and, and, and the reply, uh, turned out to be from his own mother. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh All my right. goodness. So his mother worked for him? So his, his mother actually in, his mother proposed that Henry hire his younger brother, Richard, for the job. You know, Richard didn't even call in himself. It was his mom. <laughs> that was the first helicopter mom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, Richard did join, and uh, his, the brothers focused on bookkeeping, but also did some tax work for clients. Now, uh, the brothers found that doing taxes was time-consuming and decided they were going to give it up. Wow. All right? So, you know, the thing that it's known for is taxes, but... Uh, they, they, they thought it was like too time consuming for too little pay. But then uh, one of their clients, a guy named John White, uh, who was an ad salesman for the Kansas City Star, suggested the blocks make tax preparation a separate business. And he developed an ad for them announcing $5 tax services. Wow. At that time, uh, you got to remember $5 was a was, significant amount. Yeah, it was, you know. Is something like $50 or, or maybe even more. Uh, so the blocks mulled it over skeptically, but they agreed to run the ad in 1955. Um, the next day, the very next day after, after running the ad in the Kansas City Star, uh, they had an office full of tax clients. <laughs> Wow, one yeah. day. Just, and, th yeah. and this was just for businesses, not for like an individual? Yeah, it was for businesses, uh, small businesses. Right. You, know, what, you know, who had really to keep their books on their own and had to um, organize their taxes on their own. It's complex. Because there weren't, stuff. Yeah. as he read in Harvard Business School, there weren't these services for small businesses. They were all for big businesses. So they got the office full of tax clients and that spoke to them. Uh, so they created a new business called H&R Block. Now they used the name Block B-L-O-C-K instead of their actual name block, B-L-O-C-H, uh, because they didn't want people to mispronounce it as like blotch. 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 Yeah. <laughs> I got a blotch doesn't sound on my good. Very <laughs> positive word. Right, right. So, uh, but within weeks, you know, it, when they had been, you know, trudging along with this bookkeeping business, within weeks, the company grossed more than $20,000 which was about one third of the annual gross of their bookkeeping business. So um, they gave up the bookkeeping business and focused on taxes. Wow. That's such you a know, good story. Which is sort of like the opposite of what they intended to do. Isn't uh, that, I mean, it was it just always this seems one to guy. work out that though. Like it's just, it just happens that something hits a serendipity. Is that what the word well, would be? Remember that we're analyzing companies that are publicly traded now on the market so we're looking at the success stories. Okay. You know, there's a lot of... You know, a lot of a people lot of, didn't get the yeah, serendipity blessing. Yeah, yeah. Correct, um, I agree. So uh, then they... they Okay, they, they opened up a second location in New York City. Um, and that was immediately profitable. Where were they at? They were in Kansas City. So they went yeah. from Kansas City right to New York. Now, the... the um, at that time, the IRS would actually offer services to per help small businesses organize their taxes okay uh, because they wanted to make sure that small businesses <laughs> paid their taxes yeah you know? like that that's that's kind of like a, a backward system that's like trusting your like 
Yeah, I know. Pay, like, I'm trying to think of a metaphor, but, like... Right, right. Like, uh, like, are you really gonna trust the IRS to give you all your breaks whenever yeah. they're the ones that are getting... Ethically, like, they would the have to, from. though, right? I mean, ethically, mm-hmm. they would... It's the IRS. Uh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure where that. ethics play into... <laughs> yeah, I mean, right, right. I think you're right, but I don't know if, you know, they play by those rules. It's, it's like uh, putting the dog catcher in charge of the kennel. Yeah, and they would keep track of all I of I just your... thought of that. <laughs> Hilarious. All right. So, uh, neither of them wanted to move to New York City because they all they both were married with kids at this point. All right. Uh, so they agreed to sell the New York City branch, even though it was immediately profitable. Wow. Uh, they wanted to sell it and make some money. Two New York accountants wanted to buy it, but they didn't have enough money uh, to buy it for what the blocks said it was worth. Okay. Um, and the accountants agreed that it was worth that. So what they did is they made a deal where the accountants paid them $10,000, but they also had to keep paying them royalty on their sales. Okay. All right. So Sounds like nice. the first franchise. Exactly. That created the first H&R Block franchise tax office. You are absolutely wow, right. That's I like that setup better. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I actually like that too. Uh, because, you know, you don't have to invest so much yep. into the capital and whatnot. And somebody else deals with all the hassles of the employees and everything. And you, just, you just get your Perpetual check. Every day. You just get your just, check. Yeah, <laughs> and they use the name. Um, so this became the model that they would use for all of their subsequent expansions. You know, they just kind of stumbled onto this by negotiating. And wow. it became a uh, group. They liked it so much that they used it uh, forever. All right, so in the following years, H&R Block grew quickly, um, and it went public in 1962. Now, they were by that time, they were in like, uh, you know, 20 different cities, all right, and, and they had franchises all over. Uh, pretty much the only one they owned was, uh, outright, was the Kansas City one. The original one. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Kansas City's a good place to call home, though. Great yeah, barbecue, I, I, great blues. Right yeah, in the middle good. of everything. You're not too far, <laughs> too close. You're just there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, the, the the beef there is excellent. It's super thing. fresh. Yeah, yeah like the steaks are like this thick. Like cows wandering around all over the outside of the city. <laughs> like, please save us. <laughs> so, this is a very fine line between urban and rural, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so now fast forward to, to 1986. By 1986, they were handling more than 10 million tax returns each year. Wow. Um, and they had uh, offices not only in the United States, but also in Canada and Australia. Um, in that year, uh, they worked with the IRS to introduce electronic filing. They were the first. They originated that. Um, today, they operate over 12,000 retail tax offices around the world, uh, and they have extensive operations online, uh, which we'll discuss momentarily. All right, um, now, let's look at the company now, all right? This, uh, the stock uh, in 2014 was $28 a share. Now it's $23 a share. One year ago, it was $35 a share. Oh, wow. Okay, so it's gone down a lot in the last one year. Wow. And why is that? Well, it, all right, this is a company that has a $5 billion market cap. When did it, when did it uh, first start, like, the... I, IPO or initial uh, public? Oh, when w- the IPO was 62. 62 okay. Yeah, so it's been around for a long time. Um, the PE on this company is 13.65. The dividend is 3.86%. Very nice. Um, return on invested capital, 19.82%. Well, that looks good. So, very good, yeah. Hey, can I give you a compliment real quick about um, Fidelity? <laughs> Fidelity.com. I was always a Yahoo Finance guy, but yeah, I've, yeah. Kinda, I've, I've officially switched over to Fidelity. Oh, yeah? Do you, I, I give you more complete information, I think. Yeah, they, they are pretty good. Yeah, I like Fidelity a lot. Not I mean, that Yahoo I, Finance isn't great, but... I use Yahoo Finance for information sometimes still, too. Uh, and I use the Wall Street Journal website, too. They won't let me on there. They want money. Yeah, they do want money. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, <laughs> Now, here's uh, one of the stumbling blocks. Um, the net debt to equity is infinite. 
<laughs> okay? <laughs> and that is because they have negative equity. All right, so they have a billion dollars in debt and uh, like negative $200 million in equity. That poses a question. They've been mm -hmm. in business since they went public in 62. Why do they have so much debt? Okay. They're just franchising. They're not building buildings. Well, they, they changed their business model significantly in 2015. Oh, to go online mostly? Well, no, no, no. Uh, no, they still, their most profitable business by far it's is welcome. still uh, in the tax offices having walk-ins yet to do, um, uh, you know, to get a tax preparer and then the walk-ins pay, you know, over $100 to get their taxes done. Okay. Okay. Uh, and, and what they do is that they actually, uh, they, they recruit people and these people go through a training program to be a tax preparer. That. Yeah. But the, the business is down. Um, and it seems to be trending that way. All right. Now, let me tell you though, uh, the analysts do think, uh, earnings are going to go up 16.8%. Always take that with a grain of salt because you know, that's, based on predictions and, and we never know for sure. And usually the predictions are too rosy. Too rosy. All right. Um, so yeah, they, so here's the deal. What they did is they, um, they had <laughs> they just a little hungry there, man. Did you my stomach? <laughs> yeah, I know. You know. We have a third participant. Uh, Feed me or more. Or a fourth That's participant. That was crazy. Right. It just kept going. So the, uh, the, the problem with this, when they when they switched uh, their uh, their business model, they got rid of their bank. They had like a bank, actually, kind uh, of like H and R Block right? Bank. Yeah, like Sears. And what they would do is, you know, they would lend people money uh, to pay their taxes who didn't have the money to pay their taxes, and uh, you know, collect interest on it until the person got um, enough money to pay. You know, either from uh, getting, uh, you know, money back on their taxes or earning it themselves, whatever they would lend people money. Now they got rid of that business in 2015, September, 2015. So since then, uh, now they were regulated as a savings and loan institution when they had the bank, but by divesting the bank, they were able to, uh, get under, they're no longer regulated as a savings and loan. So, the, Which uh, has to be crazy. With... Well, yeah, yeah, with regulations, absolutely. Yes. But so what they did then, the very first thing they did was start uh, a stock repurchase program. Okay. And uh, they allowed for three and a half billion dollars of stock repurchases. Uh, you know, the board voted on that. Uh, up to this point, they have done almost two billion dollars worth of uh, stock repurchases. And what this has done uh, is it's sent the equity into negative territory. Before that, at that point, there were about uh, one and a half billion of positive equity. Okay. Now they're negative 200 million. Okay. The way that works is, you know, you shell out uh, money to buy stock back. And, uh, you know, it, it can help uh, individual shareholders because the share count the shares outstanding decrease. So you each share that you own is a larger slice of the company. Okay. Uh, but that's a good explanation, by the way, but the company, uh, had to spend money to do that. Right. So it's like you're getting more pie, but the pie is less. Quality. Yes. Is it yes. Not as good pie? Yes, exactly. So, uh, the, it's like my uncle's vodka, like we would water it down. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but and he get, drank the vodka he, thinking it was good vodka, but then we, <laughs> we actually had the good yeah. stuff. <laughs> there's more of it, yeah, but there's... it's a low, lower quality. All right, so uh, these guys, all right, not only did they have to spend all of their cash to do that, they also had to borrow, and that's why they borrowed a billion dollars. But why, let me ask you this. Why won't you just go to the point that you have the cash and not have to borrow? Because borrowing just adds, you have to pay more interest anyway. So it doesn't, kind of defeats the purpose of buying back your stocks, does it not? I pretty much agree with that. And, and I, would, I think it was a very bad choice. And I think that's part of the reason why the stock is down so much. Because it went from a position of positive equity and no debt to 
the position where they have a lot of debt and negative equity. Okay. All right. But, you know, on the other hand, the shares do represent a bigger slice of the company. Um, so long term, it might be a good play. Well, but they're going to have to fight their way out. But of here's the other problem. Okay. And this is this is really at the crux of it. And that is that their business is headed south. All right. Each year for the last three years, their revenue has been declining. Uh, and I think the main reason for that is that people are tending to do their taxes by themselves online with an online program instead of, you know, shelling out to have a tax preparer do it. Now, even though they have um, online tax software, uh, it's not as good as their competitors, right? And, and their competitors, uh, you know, with the online tax software, um, you can do it for much cheaper. Right? Why don't they private label TurboTax under H&R Block's name? Uh, what? Wait. <laughs> Just TurboTax is, is it owned by Intuit, which is the next company that we're going to talk about. But but I'm saying if all right we'll talk about it. But, but I'm just they're saying a that, competitor. That, that I know, but the, but it would be beneficial to them. To, there's still a lot of people that want to do business with H and R Block, but both companies would win by just labeling H and R Block tax. Do you think? Yeah, I think TurboTax is sort of established in the name of its own. It has. If you in in maybe H and R Block is even associated with uh, spending more money on taxes, you know, on tax preparation. That's a complex question. <laughs> All right. So here's another weird thing. Uh, I'm in, glad I stumped you. In 2016, um, total tax returns filed are down 5.8%. Through the company or just like overall? No, overall. overall total tax returns. Does that mean people in left the United the States? Yeah, I was going to say, like, don't, isn't that kind of like you have to? Or just or people, uh, people died. Like, uh, it, it means that more people are just not filing their taxes. <laughs> <laughs> That's... That's a it's straight up illegal how sort many, of a negative trend. But how many? How do they get away with that? Yeah, like, like, I, mean, they don't, don't, I think like you can get away with that. On you you, hard. Yeah, but uh, I think my understanding is that it takes a long time before the IRS catches up with you. Uh, so, and also, but like, then you're gonna get crushed with taxes and penalties. I think a lot of it has to do with Obamacare too, because uh, you know there's a penalty uh, for not being insured. There so, is like, if you are yeah. not so insured for... people would for... rather, like, eat the penalty from not paying their taxes versus the penalty of not Yes, paying exactly. Uh, it, you know, the penalty for not paying your taxes uh, is a certain amount of interest that you have to pay. But what if you didn't know any taxes and you just had fees for not being insured? That would be an incentive to not file at all. Yeah, that's true. So, um... I figure out how Ob Obamacare stuff, works. Yeah. I figured out how it works. How's it work? Before Obamacare, I didn't have health care. After Obamacare, I don't have a doctor. Because I called yeah. my doctor. I'm like, I'm sick. He's like, I could see you in November. I said, I said I'll be well, dead. Well, I'll, I'll be fine or I'll be dead. So yes. yeah. Pencil me in. And then I'm going to charge you for the copay for the consult on the <laughs> phone call. Well, I, yeah. At the same time, you know, a lot of people do get insured that what, we're yeah, not otherwise yeah, insured. Had a right? pre-existing condition. Um, and also, uh, you know, sometimes the insurance under Obamacare is actually more reasonable than you could get in the private market. Well, I just want to clarify that I was just saying that for the hence of a joke. I'm not yeah, you're not like making a political <laughs> stance no, right no, there. Never, never, never. Okay, good. I'm glad everybody gets health care. Okay, so, so uh, you know, when you look at this company and boil it down, the main thing, even though it, I think it was a very stupid thing to repurchase $2 billion worth of shares... Uh, the main thing is that the business is declining. Revenue is going down in a trend for three on years. On two fronts. One on just people doing it, walk in, and then the other part that people just aren't filing taxes. Yes, you're right. But people not filing taxes doesn't mean that your business is necessarily going to go down. You know, if you were good at marketing it or if you had a business that was that really had a competitive advantage. Well, this this seems to lend itself back to what they said earlier, where they were loaning people the money to do their taxes and get caught up. That would seem to be a good media play by them. They ditched that business. Oh, yeah. So yeah, they <laughs> ditched that in 2015. Yeah, then so now right. it's just tax preparation. So, uh, but so, they could still talk to people that haven't filed their taxes and say, "Hey, 
Let's get you caught up so you can sleep at night, and then you can go buy a mattress. They could, maybe, and yeah. figure out your sleep number. A good marketing campaign might not hurt. But uh, as it stands, uh, th- th- this is a flagging business. So even though it looks good from a value perspective and it pays a nice dividend, uh, you got to stay away. Uh, it's very risky to have uh, a bunch of debt and negative equity and also have a declining business. You know what this reminds me of? The one we, uh, GameStop. Remember how I was real high on GameStop and you said that that business is going to go away pretty soon. Well, but not, not as much as this right now. You're seeing more of a marked decline in this. I don't know. I'd, I'd say the decline is pretty similar in those two. You know, the, the problem with GameStop is very similar to the problem with H&R Block. And, and that's that, uh, you know, it's the trend is to go online yeah, and download to download everything. games. Right. Uh, just like the trend with uh, taxes is to pay it online. Or yep. just not do them. <laughs> right. <laughs> or, yeah, I know. Apparently that's some of it, too. Uh, so I, I have to give a thumbs down to H&R Block. Uh, and, and now we're going to take a little break. Because it's still hot in here, even though it's October. I know, it's very hot. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was like but I, 50-something yesterday. I'm like, wow, it's probably actually not bad in, in, in the studio. But yeah. Now, now we're back up to like... I think yeah, I 75, yeah. yeah. I wore a heavier shirt. <laughs> and then I thought it would be cooler, but yeah, see, you're, I was wrong. You're consistently remaining at the I'm same I'm still not sweating at your level. <laughs> I aspire good. to sweat at Tom That's Henry's good. level. You, you don't want to aspire to that. <laughs> what are we going to talk about next? All right. We're, next, we're going to talk about Intuit, which is the competitor that I mentioned that does TurboTax. But right now, we're going to take a quick break for promos. Great. Matt Geike, your host of Geike's Got Game, 8 a.m. every Friday here on the River's Edge. I'll take a peek behind the sports media curtain. Zoom out for the big picture, and as always, obsess over the details of the sports, teams, and players we love or love to hate. It's Geek Scott Game, every Friday at 8 a.m. on the River's Edge. Hi, I'm Mike Storr, host of the Awesome Cast, which you can hear right here on River's Edge Radio. We're talking tech, getting geeky every week with people from Pittsburgh in the industry. Go check us out, awesomecast.net, or listen to us right here on River's Edge Radio, Thursday mornings, 8 a.m. after Funny Money. You didn't wash your hands! People who do not wash their hands should be fined. And I'm sorry, I don't know about all of you, but if you're going to castrate me, you might as well just kill me! So enjoy your hot dog, you jackass! Get educated with Brian Crawford live Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 10 a.m. here on the River's Edge. Hey, this is Mike Sasson. If you've been searching for something to do with your pathetic life, guess what? This ain't it. But it'll kill about an hour. It's the Mike Sasson Show starting 10 a.m. on July 19th. Going to 11. It's going to be a lot of fun here on the River's Edge, a new kind of radio. Okay, and we're back to talk about uh, a very interesting company here, Intuit. I, I'm still kind of depressed about H&R Block. I yeah, like I know. I have it's that kind toy of a sad st- story. It seems like... It's an American icon. They've but... kind of wrecked it over the last couple Are of years. Are you going to short it? Uh, no. Mm-hmm. Um, no. I'm not like that adamant about it. Uh, but, you know, that, that it would go down. Because it is it is cheap and it's come down a lot. Um, I just don't don't want to buy it here. <laughs> uh so uh so that's even worse it's like just sheer apathy <laughs> <laughs> no no it's not as bad as a company that you want to short all right so uh into it um i gotta cite my sources here they are wikipedia of course and uh hbs.edu forward slash entrepreneurs hbs stands for Har- harvard business school um so Intuit is also a stock that I have owned but do not own currently. And what is the symbol? INTU. INTU. What was the H&R Block symbol? HRB. HRB. Great. All right. So Intuit um, is a larger company than H&R Block currently. Uh, but l- let's talk about Scott Cook, uh, who is the founder. Born in 1952, Scott Cook eventually attended USC. There's very little information about this guy. He like floated under the radar. <laughs> 
All right, uh, where he earned a bachelor's degree in economics and mathematics. All right, so two he's... things you never use. <laughs> <laughs> so after graduating, he went to Harvard Business School. Um, I'm sure he was a dumbass. See, both it's interesting <laughs> that both of these founders went to Harvard Business School, um, where he earned an MBA in 1976. Uh, Cook then started his career at Procter and Gamble in Cincinnati. Ohio. Good, great company. Yeah, oh, yeah, I gotta write that huge down. company, uh, where he learned about product development and market research and marketing, um, and he met his wife Signe Osby there too, but. Uh, yeah, Procter and Gamble, um, you know, does intense marketing. Uh, if, if you know the, the, their brands, uh, you know, are like Crest. Yes. Um, uh, name me some more. Come on. Uh, uh, they have like Colgate. No. Uh, no. No. Cottonelle. Cottonelle. Uh, well, all of they don't believe in line extensions. I know that because everything carries its own significant brand and carries a lot more weight. Right. When, when you go into um, like a drugstore or the part of the supermarket that sells like deodorant and toothpaste Toiletries. and stuff they, they're like uh, you it's, know 20 percent of what's on the shelf it's procter and gamble and kimberly clark right yeah that yes those are huge uh right and is there there's a third one too somewhere in there all right but uh oh i think colgate palm olive would be the third yeah one. that's because yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah because i love that company colgate yeah. because they have great they had the best roic not it, roic it, but roe back when i was in the roe days before you <laughs> converted me to they ROIC. do have really good return on equity but a lot of that is because the equity is so low so uh we'll, we we can talk about that one later all right but uh so working for procter and gamble he learned about all this marketing stuff and product development um so you know you can see his background is in business in general in marketing and economics and math uh now not not in computers or computer programming in 19 uh you know graduating in from uh getting your master's in 1976 you wouldn't imagine it would be no you know? exactly because it was like pre-computer there right. might have been very rudimentary yeah, computers yeah. Back then. right right they'd be like they probably took up the whole things. building yeah right? <laughs> <laughs> it was so, the ones you see on uh on six million dollar man we can rebuild him we have the technology <laughs> so he left procter and gamble uh to take a job in strategic consulting at bain and company remember that's the that's the uh, consulting firm that uh, romney worked for i didn't know that what do you mean remember in, in never... menlo park california uh, uh mitt romney yeah mitt romney all right um he's, he's probably kicking himself right now he soon began using why why because it... if he would have won if he ran he's well, well, I don't know. No, there were like 16 Republicans who ran, and Trump was, was the best they could come up with. <laughs> you know what GOP stands for right now? Got other plans. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. So, um, yeah, they were, wow, they're ditching Trump in droves. Oh, my God. All right, but we're not talking politics. Okay, so uh, he, he went. This um, is an apolitical show. Yes, it is. So he, he was consulting at Bain. Uh, in Menlo Park, California. Um, and then he soon began reflecting on the insights he learned at Procter & Gamble. Um, so he, he started to look for an idea to start a company of his own. You know, he had that entrepreneurial bug. Um, and that idea came to him one day when his wife, Signe, was complaining about paying the bills. <laughs> All right? Yeah. Uh, she was like, you know, oh, it's such a hassle. I can't always remember everything. Um, so what did he do? He went on a quest to find a programmer <laughs> to help him make software, all right? And the software was to be intended to help people organize their finances and pay bills easily. This is before the days of Microsoft Even, Excel. This was before <laughs> business. Yes. This was like just in your home, like home economics. Yes, just an individual. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so, <clears throat> okay, the first programmer he ran into... Uh, was named Tom Prulx, P-R-O-U-L-X, at Stanford. He said, oh, Stanford, he picked a good school for that. Yeah, yeah, he did. Uh, and, and programmers were very far and few between at that time, all right? Uh, so he, he got him, uh, and uh, the guy agreed to go in with him. You know, he would do the programming, uh, and uh, Scott would, would do the uh, financing and the marketing and the business side of it, all right? 
So in 1983, the Dewar, the duo. Found it, <laughs> Dewar. I have to apologize. Dewar, like, I, 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 yeah, my you, body you is making fourth. all kind of make noises. All kind of make noises. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hey, that that was a subtle slip. You're like, Arr. you want to, <laughs> you want McDonald's. Yes. All right. <laughs> my body I'm is making make noises. <laughs> <laughs> I'm loving, loving it. Yeah. yeah, we just wrote a new commercial for them. What if that hits? <laughs> <laughs> It's not bad, really. I mean, I would, I would use it. Yeah. <laughs> I heard it here first. I'm so embarrassed. So, uh, <laughs> going out to the world. They started out uh, working out of uh, a modest room in University Avenue in Palo Alto. Okay. Uh, the first version of Quicken was coded in Microsoft Basic. Uh, that was like a really old, old programming language for the IBM PC. And they also did Pascal. For the I Apple too. Pascal. I remember both of those things. So were they aiming this at like just home, like people in their house? Yes. But like yes. how many of them would have had a PC to use this stuff? Well, on? back then, uh, you know, probably like uh, it would be the like maybe like 5% wealthiest yeah. part of luxury, the country. Right. right. Yeah. At that point. And they had a lot of bills. Probably. Yeah, that's true. right. Yeah. So there they was a lot of organization to yeah, do. They were running a mini business because they probably had hired help. Right? Yeah. yeah, that's true. That's true. So, um, <laughs> but they weren't the only ones in this market. They actually had to contend with a dozen serious competitors. Are you kidding me? No. Wow. No, they were not See the that? only ones coming up with this idea. They, there See was a bunch coming up with this idea at the same time. Wow. All right. Uh, but uh, there, the guy he found at Stanford did a great job. Um, and their company was a success and, and they rose to the top. So, uh, Intuit then decided, all right, meaning these two guys, uh, to launch similar software for small businesses instead of just for individuals, you know? Okay. So the first one was Quicken, uh, and, and then this, uh, for small businesses was QuickBooks. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay. That, so that's one I remember. Quick is QuickBooks Quicken still around or no? Quicken is, yes. Wow. Uh, QuickBooks features uh, a double entry accounting package now, uh, which is different from Quicken. So with QuickBooks, you know, you can do like standard accounting credits for debits. a business. Right. Yes. Right. Where you don't need to do that for an individual. You can just, you know, organize your bills and just know what uh, you're going to be charged each month. And, and, and Quicken would also track your expenditures and compare month to month, you know, how much you're spending on. White. This right, right. <laughs> so you would be aware when you're like spending's a little high, maybe you want to cut back or something like that. On coffee for me. So uh, uh and quick, wing night. QuickBooks is just standard. like the standard bookkeeping for businesses. All right. In 1993, uh, QuickBooks was a success, and in 1993, Intuit went public. They had these two very strong products, Quicken and QuickBooks. Um, and they used the proceeds to make a key acquisition. They bought a tax preparation software company, Chipsoft, which was based in San Diego. Now, Chipsoft had developed a program called TurboTax. Right? Wow. So uh, TurboTax, as we know, is, is very uh, big now. And, and it's, it's, it's become a huge component of the Intuit portfolio. Oh, nice. Uh, really and, nice. and a direct competitor with companies like H&R Block. <clears throat> Okay, um, Intuit today is a huge global firm worth about twenty-seven point five billion. Jeez! All right, so compare that to five billion. You know, and, and you know, remember the five billion and shrinking. They started out with just a little bit of money, uh, right? And H and R Block is five billion. So now this company is very different. Uh, the, in two thousand fourteen, the stock was at sixty-seven. And now it's at uh, 108. Okay, and it's it's gone up, you know, uh, pretty uh, consistently every year. Um, and their sales have gone up pretty consistently every year, and their earnings have gone up pretty consistently. It was every green year. across the board on Fidelity. Now, uh, th but I will say, last year was a great year. Uh, earnings were up like 46 percent mm -hmm. you know uh huge how did you find out about this or what made you want to do this stock tonight uh oh it, it was uh you know 
uh, the tax issue for Trump that kind of put it in my mind. Oh, uh, okay. That um, makes sense. So that, that's why. You know, it's not tax time or anything. But I was kind of wondering about that, too. I'm like, is yeah. it in, like, March no. or April or something like that? Yeah, April 15th. He still hasn't... Re oh, my bad. You're right there, dude. Oh, uh, jeesh. My bad. I forgot <laughs> to turn that off. That's Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? You're like, that's enough of that crap. <laughs> Like I, I sent out tax documents. I'm being audited. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Right? Audit. I can't do it. <laughs> uh, so, all right, uh, this company. Okay, now when you go back uh, to H and R Block, you might look at that as a value stock. This is not a value this stock. A, this is a growth that's stock. That's crazy right? growth. Yeah. So the PE on this is 35. H and R Block was 13.65. The dividend, 1.26 percent. That's not nothing. Uh, return on invested capital, 36%. Excellent. Now, here's another excellent thing. No net debt. Okay? This is, this is they like don't a, have a precarious situation. Like a win all around. It's... Like, uh, I, I would This might be one of our best ones. I have to agree with that, that uh, I am giving the thumbs up on this one. Is it, and it's a very rare thumbs up, as you know. Is it uh, maybe too expensive at 108 uh, bucks a share? That I mean, that seems steep, but I mean, uh, you, I mean you're the experts. So. Well, it's really uh, – uh, don't think of it like that. It, it's, um, you know, whatever the share price is uh, isn't relevant. really that relevant. I mean, what the important thing is – Is there you going to make like your money off? How much uh, – okay. right. How much are you paying for this stream of earnings? So uh, I would look okay. at it more like it's 35 times earnings. Okay. I, am I going to, is that, are the, is that going to go up? Is the stock going to go up? And earnings well, are going I, up I think every year. With, when the return on invested capital is 36% and the P is 35, that's a pretty good sign. That's a sign of really good management. 36% return on invested capital. Uh, sure. That means that these people, they've invested and they know how to do it right. Okay. Uh, not only that, but the analysts are forecasting uh, gr earnings growth this year, 2016, of 43%. Okay, so another banner year is what they're forecasting. See, to me, this equates to, did you ever go to the store when they first introduced those self-service aisles? Yeah. Like, yeah. In, I didn't do it because I was afraid, right? That's exactly with taxes. There's still a lot of people out there that... They don't trust they see that it's it. easy, but they don't trust themselves. I, I can understand, right? That. So yeah. I think there's still a large group of people that will jump on board slowly, and so it's not going to be all at once. But it's that provides a steady stream stream of increased users. And and I, I imagine the software gets more like user friendly and stuff like that. Yeah, and correct it. it and yes, whatnot. and you subscribe uh, so that like uh, it's not like oh you buy the software one time and then you don't need to pay again. No, it's a no it, it gets updated each mm -hmm. year because there are always changes in the tax rules. Right. Yeah. Uh, so you uh, always have the you always have the latest version. Right, you always have the latest version, uh, and they'll update it. It, it. You just download it, you know, and uh, but you subscribe, so it, you pay once a year. Now, I can tell you that this subscription model, it used to be a thing called perpetual licenses because I used to sell them through Autodesk, where it was almost like getting season tickets where you say you pay $5,000 for the right to own this seat and you own that seat. Now it's just subscription and it's such a better cash model and profitability model. And I imagine anything. in this particular instance, it's like a lot of people probably feel like they're making their money back. Yeah. Because, I mean, you do your taxes well, you get a nice return. Maybe you can cover your... Um, your subscription for it and then absolutely let alone versus paying for somebody else to do it if you didn't right it's not it nearly as expensive as paying for h and r block to prepare mm. your taxes for example so uh <laughs> it it's a great model uh oh, and it's very popular um and now what they did is um with quicken uh quicken sort of sorry. fell out of their model because uh it it what what they try what they are doing now is only stuff that is cloud based, so that uh, you know you can use it on your phone. Mm -hmm. TurboTax, QuickBooks, you can use on your phone. You can use it on a, a, a iPad. But Quicken was still like really for desktops, right? Okay, and it, uh, you know it didn't have that aspect of um, you know needing to be updated from the cloud you know 
So it did, you know, it, it, it was that thing that you could just buy one time and organize your finances for the rest of your life. For the rest of your life yeah. Right. So at this point, like last year, uh, Quicken was only contributing like 1% of their revenue. Because yeah, everyone got it. Mm, right. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think there's also a trend of people starting their own businesses and that, I mean, it's, it's overwhelming to want to start your own business, but QuickBooks makes it almost seamless to say, hey, you can do it too. Yeah, so that's, there's going to be a lot more people that go for it. Used. Even if their business fails, they're going to have to get that program or subscribe to it. Mm -hmm. So they sold quick into a hedge fund, uh, which closed in February, that deal. And they also sold, uh, they had acquired another business called Demand Force, which is a marketing uh, tool, a software tool. But it's also like Quicken in the sense that it's really just desktop based and it's a... Mm -hmm. Uh, a, a one-shot sell and you don't need the cloud so uh, they they want to focus on this cloud-based business which is much high, higher margin no it's, it's and, and it's continuous a... you know the market market never gets saturated not only that you don't have to print discs not only that the another good thing is that um, although they're by far the dominant software in the United States uh, they've barely touched uh, outside the United States. I mean, they're in other countries, but you know, not, I imagine it's they don't have very much revenue. Right. Every, every country has its different tax codes. And, in, in a lot of countries, you know, there are certain countries where you wouldn't want TurboTax, like Italy, uh, because nobody really pays the, the right amount of taxes there. It's like all <laughs> negotiable, you know, and like, uh, have some wine, sit down, Greece, you know, or yeah. like, um, or even China, or, you know, Chinese, are known to keep like uh, different sets of books, you know, like oh, the, they have really? one, the real one that they keep at home under their bed. And then they have like the one that they show the public to the, t you know, no, they have a much lamer one that they show the government <laughs> and they pay taxes on that, you know, instead of the real deal, what they really earned. Uh, that happens in the United States too, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's not much, much more aggressively prosecuted in the United States than it is in China. And it's much w more widespread in China. You know, so I, I don't think, uh, I, I think that this program, which goes by the letter of the law, is good in the United States. It would be good in Northern Europe, be good in Japan, yep. but, you know, not good in Australia, Canada, but not so much, you know, in South America, not so much in Southern Europe. Where it's, it's, it's slightly more. Yeah, uh, not, not in China. Not where, where they're quite as legally bind. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> they're not to the letter of the law as much. So uh, this might be your. You don't want to be the one joker who's paying full tax. Yeah, you like, know? No, exactly. and everyone else is, uh, you know, paying uh, half that. So uh, it, I think it does, but it's not all over these places. It's not in Northern Europe very much. It's not in Japan very much. Uh, so it does have a lot of room to expand, and uh, I like that aspect of it as well. Um. I'm not sure it's like, you know, a home run, but I do think it's a very solid buy. Uh, I would say it's going it, to, in my estimation, be very likely that it, it grinds up, you know, like the way it has over the last three years. Um, so I, I definitely give it a thumbs Who's up. Who's their big competition? Buy into it as part of your diversified portfolio. That's great. Who's their biggest online competitor? Uh, actually, it's H&R Block. Oh, then yeah, they're, they're blowing them out of the water. Yeah, they're blowing them out of the water. Competitors That's are true. a loose term there. Right, right. They have a near monopoly on this, uh, you know, in terms of the TurboTax. Uh, QuickBooks, you know. I like the alliteration of the name also. Well, actually, you know what? I take that back. Actually, the uh, there is another. Microsoft has Microsoft Money. That's probably their biggest competitor. Okay. And, and Microsoft obviously has Excel. Uh, you know, which people use mm -hmm. and they don't need QuickBooks if you, you know, if you're good with Excel. Um, so, so Microsoft is probably their biggest competitor now that I reconsider. Um, good point, but it's a buy. It's a buy. Definitely. Wow. Yes. We're so excited. We should do a little, yeah. we should have a little buy dance. Yeah. Like, a, like we a, need to get a buy dance. I, we don't have, do it. Track for I don't have show one. Me. I can share a dance. <laughs> I can dance like the little. Show me what you're talking about. <laughs> That's it. It's a buy. All right, so you know, uh, with that, we give one thumbs down on H and R Block, and we have one thumbs up on Intuit. Um, Very good, good find. Tonight, good find. we're all out of funny money. Talk to you next. Thanks week. for listening. Thanks.